<laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before we proceed, I would just like to ask everyone to uh, put their phone on silent mode so we can have some peace and quiet. Thank you. And we shall be proceeding immediately. Okay. Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the public series, public lecture series of Ateneo de Manila University. We shall have uh, the national anthem and the invocation right now. Can I therefore ask everyone to please stand for the national anthem and the invocation? standing while the invocation is being delivered by Janine. Good morning, everyone. You may now make the sign of your faith. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us together to listen and to learn from each other. May we find your voice in the stories that will be shared today, and may we open our minds and our hearts to what we are called to do as students, teachers, and citizens. We ask you to continue to bless the mission of the Negrense Volunteers to Change Foundation, and may they flourish in their mission as they work to instill social justice, sustainability, discourse, peace, and development in the nation. You may now make the sign of your faith. Amen. Thank you all very much. You may now take your seats and we shall proceed with the program. We have a full house today. Thank you. Uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the public lecture series of the university. This morning, we shall hear the story of how a small, nonprofit, grassroots organization in Negros the Negrense Volunteers for Change Foundation, or NVC, grew into a multi-million peso social enterprise, all the while adhering to the mission of providing proper nutrition for children and sustainable livelihood for the residents of the islands of the Visayas. For this outstanding public service, the Ateneo de Manila University awarded the NVC with the Parangal Lingkod Sambayanan in traditional rights last year. Today, we are privileged and proud to have the founding trustee and the president CEO of NVC to share with us the inspirational narrative of this extraordinary movement. Our speaker is an alumna of St. Scholastica's Academy of Bacolod, and the University of La Salle Bacolod. In her early corporate career, she was a journalist, a public servant, and entrepreneur prior to her volunteer work in community services and various outreach activities. For her efforts in public service, she has received recognition from the 10 Outstanding Women in the Nation's Service, or TOWNS. 
the City of Bacolod, St. Scholastica's Academy, and the University of La Salle, Bacolod. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker in her lecture, Love and Thunder, Madame Milagros Mili Kilaiko. Thank you, Mr. Valencia. Can I use this? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what Mr. Valencia did not mention was that I am a spinster. But I have many men. And I will talk to you about the men in my lives later. But first, let me talk to you about our organization. We are a dozen years old. Uh, we organized ourselves in 2010, and we organized ourselves by chance. We were actually part of a political campaign. We were just small, regular volunteers, but we were up against a political force. In Negros Occidental, my home province, we have 32 cities and municipalities, and all 31 of the mayors of these 32 were for the candidate who, were, who was not ours. There was only one mayor of the smallest town of Negros Occidental who was for our candidate. But our candidate won by a very, very large margin. And so we saw the power of the ordinary person. We realized that political forces are no match when the ordinary person performs and plans and delivers with their heart. So after our electoral victory, we talked among ourselves. We didn't want to work for government. We didn't want to hold public office. But because we knew the power of the ordinary person, then we knew we had to do something because we could make a difference even if we only worked within our backyards. So we brainstormed and got ourselves organized with hardly any money. And our first project was to identify public schools in need of classrooms. We did this for a Manila organization. And because we had no money, all we really had to do was just to look for the schools which were in need. The money was provided by the organization, which is Manila-based. And so we turned over the first classroom. It was a kindergarten classroom. And in that kindergarten classroom, I saw one boy who was taller than the rest. And so I asked the teacher, how old is this boy? And she said, he's nine years old. So I asked the teacher, what's a nine-year-old boy doing in kindergarten among all the five-year-old kids? She said, it's only now that his parents can afford enough money to give that boy a good breakfast so that he could have enough energy to walk several kilometers to school. And I said, wow, when he gets to be a teenager, he'll only be gained two or three. And what teenager would want to be in school with little kids? And she said, no, you're wrong. I said, why? And the teacher said, there are seven other siblings back home. So next year, the next sibling will go to kindergarten. And the following year, another sibling will go to the kindergarten because the parents cannot afford to feed more than just one child a good breakfast daily. So I thought to myself, what good are pretty classrooms if children cannot go to school because they are hungry? What good are pretty classrooms if children cannot even listen in class because their stomachs grumble with hunger? And so I knew that the next project we should do whether we had money or not, was to find ways to feed small children with hungry little stomachs. And so we went on a search. I talked to the Department of Science and Technology and asked the regional director. He said, I know you have an unused noodle making machine. Can you give that to us so we can make noodles and feed the children in the neighborhood? And he said to me, if you are serious about nutrition, then look for children who are in the ages of six months to five years old, because that is the most important stage of a child's development, 
That's when his cognitive skills, his social skills, his emotional skills develop. And unless that child gets proper nutrition in his early years, no amount of improved nutrition after will change the life of the child. You cannot compensate for bad nutrition, which happened early in the child's life. And so the Department of Science and Technology introduced us to the formula for complementary food for infants and toddlers. The formula was made of rice, mongo, and sesame seeds. We did not want to use sesame seeds because we don't grow sesame seeds extensively in the Philippines. We did not want to use imported raw ingredients because we wanted all our products and all our raw materials to serve the Filipino farmer. And so a group of our volunteers who are in the food industry went on research and looked for an alternative to sesame seeds. And they began to use moringa, or what we ordinarily call malungay. And then we developed our product, which we call mingo. Um, it's complementary food in sachets, instant and powdered, which we produce in our factory. And we began to raise funds to be able to produce this product. Our members began to organize golf tournaments. We organized two of them and did other kinds of fundraising exercises until we, only, we, had, we were one million short, one million pesos short of creating a factory. Then one day, someone came to my office and asked about the organization. And she talked for hours and hours asking about our organization. And she asked me to bring her back to her hotel. A few days later, I got a call from this lady. And she said, do you need anything in your organization? I said, yes, we need one million pesos. But I caught myself because I said, wow, she might find it too big and, and you know, just ran away. So I said, but you don't have to give a million. You can give 100,000 or 50,000 or even five pesos. We'd appreciate that. And she said, no, I give you a million pesos. Give me your bank account right now. It has to be in this bank. I'm going back. Uh, to my home country. She did not speak with a local accent. She had a foreign accent. She said, I'm going back. I have to deposit it into this account, into your account, but it has to be in this bank because I am in this bank right now. We did not have an account in that bank. So I said, if you give us a week, we can open an account. But she said, no, I have to deposit into that account from this bank right now. I said, I have an account in that bank, but it's personal. And she said, I don't mind. Just, it's your problem. Just give it to your organization. And so I gave her the account number. A few minutes later, she called and she said, I have deposited into your account. So I knew that was before the days of online banking. So I knew that I had to transfer. I had to go to the bank to transfer into the foundation's account. And I remembered. So I called our trustees and I said, there's one million pesos in my bank account. If I die on the way to the bank, please note that there's money there that doesn't belong to me. Of course, I didn't die. I was able to transfer the money, and we were able to begin to produce our um, bingo meals. So we began to work on the field of nutrition, and then we began to introduce this. It, I thought it was a breeze, introducing um, this complementary food to the local government to introduce this to the mayors. But no, I realized that the mayors preferred projects which would put their names on waiting sheds rather than something that would go into little children's stomachs without giving their names. So it was a difficult task. But I think you're too young to remember, but in 2013 there was this um, Zamboanga siege, where a lot of evacuees went into town uh, within the city of Zamboanga. There were several evacuation centers. And with the help of some of our friends, we were able to send this. At that time, they were packing plastic, um, just small plastic pouches. So we sent this to an evacuation center. And in those evacuation centers, someone noticed that there was one evacuation center where the children fared better than everybody else. These children did not develop cough, they did not develop fever, they were eating better, and they were healthier than the children in the other evacuation centers. And so this lady tried to find out what was the difference. And the difference was the mingo meal. 
The children in the evacuation center where the children were healthier all had mingo meals, not the other children who were less healthy. And so people began to appreciate what this was. People began to um, notice and they began to purchase. And so then we had a little money running the organization. So it began to be recognized. And when the Marawi siege happened, we were so surprised because CNN Philippines listed the 10 places best to donate to. For number one was Caritas and number two was ourselves. So to us, it was a little victory. Uh, but the biggest victory was seeing the smiles of the children whom we served. To date, we have served 60 provinces across the Philippine archipelago in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. We have an 83% success rate when children are given this as their nutritional support in a program where we enroll them for daily feeding for six months and they climb from a severely underweight or an underweight condition into normalcy. We have served Mingo 23,189,693 times as of February 28, 2023. But then, seeing how children are so malnourished, we knew that malnutrition doesn't happen by chance. It is almost always a result of poverty. And we began to realize that unless we did something about the impoverished condition of their families, we will never let these children out of malnutrition. So we began to look for different ways where we could actually help alleviate the income resources of their parents. There are statistics which show that the children who live in the shoreline are more stunted and more malnourished than children who live in the mountains. So we wanted to start in the shoreline. We wanted to look at fishermen or what they call fishermen's helpers. Fishermen's helpers are people who know how to fish, but do not have boats of their own. They become assistants to fishermen. They earn 100 pesos on good days and a few pieces of fish on bad days. We had a donation which was for a boat, which a, a fisherman helper could use for livelihood so he could finally have a boat of his own. So we went to one shoreline community and began to interview some potential fishermen's helpers. Those who were out at sea had wives to whom we interviewed. It was at the end of the morning. It was almost lunchtime, so we thought we would call it a day and go back home. But before we got home, I noticed that there was a little boy who had been trailing me all morning. And he, it seemed that he didn't want to let me go. So he said, do you need anything? He said, don't go home until you meet my father. My father needs a boat. And I said, where's your father? He said, he's out at sea. I said, let me talk to your mother. And she said, my mother left my father for another man. So I said, okay, we'll wait for your father. And he said, but I have to go home and cook lunch for my siblings. He was about nine years old. And he had two other siblings back home. So I said, okay, I'll go with you. We will go with you to your home. Home was the size of a king-size bed. They had no flooring except the soil on which they stood on. And lunch was a small pot of rice. He had no money for charcoal or firewood, so he had to look for some free pieces of whatever he could find to light a start, to light, to start a fire with. And he found a few pieces of styrofoam and lit it, and, and we were full of the toxic smell of smoke, which the, two, the three little children didn't mind at all. Okay, then they had their lunch. Of course, it was rice and nothing else. Of course, they ate with their hands. And they drank water from empty cans they found in someone else's trash. So I knew right then and there in my heart that this boy's father was going to get the boat. Then the father arrived. His name was Hermie. And I said, Hermie, do you have a dream? And I expected Hermie to say, yes, 
I dream of owning a boat of my own so I can say, lo and behold, Hermie, you have a boat. But no, Hermie just looked at me. He stared blankly and he said, I have no dream. And I realized that when a man was as poor as Hermie was, a man ceases to be a human being. He only lives to eat and sleep and eat and sleep and nothing more. And so, of course, Hermie got his boat. Then we began to look at other sources of livelihood. But then, after Hermie's boat was given, we launched what we called the Peter Project. And the Peter Project went on and on, even to serve um, fishermen who lost their boats in natural disasters, especially Typhoon Yolanda. And to date, we have turned over 5,015 motorized fishing boats to fishermen and fishermen's helpers in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And we looked for other sources of ways to help people earn better livelihood. Then we looked at the farmers who were supplying the ingredients of our mango meals. And there was this, at one time, we were looking for squash because we wanted to develop the squash flavor of mango. We needed a lot of squash, and um, there was not enough in the market. So I asked a friend who worked with small farmers, and she said, yes, I know a farmer who can supply you the squash that you need. And we met this farmer. What we found out, what is farmer, and indeed from the indigenous peoples, planted a lot of squash from seeds that were given to him by the Department of Agriculture. He had a lot of unused land because he was from the indigenous peoples, and they have um, what they call their ancestral domains, land that belongs even to their forefathers. And so Merco, this farmer, planted a large tract of land with squash and had no market for it. And my friend said, just pray because you'll find the market. And at the moment Merco was praying, I was asking my friend for a source of squash. Marco was so, Merco was so frustrated about not having to sell his squash. All he wanted to do was to sell a few kilos that would give him enough money to buy a ticket to Manila where he would look for work. Because you see, Merco lost his house to fire, and he was just living in temporary quarters in that farm. He felt that there was no livelihood left for farming, and so he wanted to come to Manila and try his luck at the job. But Merco sold us the squash, and we began to buy more and more squash. We began to buy more and more vegetables. Merco never left for Manila. He is now the president of the Small Farmers Association of their farming village in Upland Negros Occidental. And in that village, we are, next month, we will be striking ground and we will be building a food processing center right in the farming area of the indigenous peoples so that they will no longer send truckloads of squash to us, but process the squash and all their other products there in the mountains. That means you double the income of the farmers. Farmers earn from selling the fruits of their land. The wives will work in the processing plant to double their income. They will send the finished products down to town using less carbon footprint. They will no longer have to send multiple trucks of squash, just one truck of squash already pulverized, dehydrated in the form that we want to use it for our product. Then we began to look at other ways where we could um, provide more income. So uh, on the Feast of St. Joseph, eight years ago, we launched Project Joseph, which would provide tools to people who already have skills. You know, we found so many people in the countryside who already knew how to sew, who already knew how to do carpentry, who knew how to do um, to drive a tricycle, to drive a pedicab, but they just had no tools. All they needed was a simple tool or equipment that could provide them jobs. And so we launched Project Joseph that could give them this equipment, these tools. A few thousand pesos could buy a mother a sewing machine and become a productive earning person in society. But then along the way, we began to see that children, of course, 
needed to be educated. There was one striking photo which our field officers sent to us from Bukidnon. It is the photo of a child writing with a very small pencil. The pencil was one third of a new pencil, which his father had to break into three because the father could only afford to buy one pencil for his three children in school. So he had to break it into three, and his little child could only bring a third of the pencil to school. Then we knew that we did not only need to feed the stomachs of the children, we have to equip them to school. And so we launched another project, project um, which provided the children with backpacks, which we called love bugs, and um, provided them school supplies, and also helped them through many ways through education, through uniforms, even shoes, or, or even just slippers, so they could walk better to school. And to date, we have helped 10,914 of these students, most of them coming from the indigenous peoples. And then going into the countryside, especially into the mountains, we saw children who had to cross treacherous rivers to school. If they had five pesos, they could ride a raft to the other side of the river. But if they didn't have five pesos, they had to swim through the river to school. If they had classrooms up in the mountains, they were exposed to the elements, to the cold, to the rain, and the wind. And we knew that we had to build them better classrooms. And so we did. We asked for help to help build classrooms in the mountains. We had to bring cement bugs on the backs of the horses. We had to bring lumber um, on the habal habal, the tricycles. We had to take most of these through carabao carts or, or even carry some of the, the building materials by foot up the mountains because trucks couldn't enter them. But to date, we have built many classrooms in the mountains, and we have built a total of 213 classrooms for children who actually would have had no roof over their heads for school. And so the question is, I've been sharing with you numbers how did we get these numbers? I wish I could say that we made studies, projections, and developed a master plan to plan all this. I wish I could tell you that we conducted deep research studies to identify the communities that we would serve. But I confess, we did not. They just really happened. For 12 years, all we have been doing was linking dreams to donors and donors to dreams. Let me show you how we got to Mindanao, for example. One night, I couldn't sleep, so I was just going through my phone, and I saw an article from Rappler. The article talked about children in Bukidnon who survived on only one piece of cassava a day. At that time, we were just working within Negros Occidental or Western Visayas. So I said, if we want to solve hunger, we have to look for these children who survive on only one piece of cassava a day. It took us five months of searching and wrong turns and wrong highways until we found the mountain that we needed to climb. So we said, okay, let's go. Let's go to this mountain. When we got to the foot of the mountain, I found that the only way to get to the top was to ride the habal habal. You know, those mountain motorcycles. And um, these were driven by individuals whom you would ride with. And you know, I have balance problems. So I've never graduated beyond the three-wheeler bike. So I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. But it was a choice between the motorcycle or the horse, which was worse for someone with balance problems. So, okay, I said, it's either I stay at the foot of the mountain or go up. So I had to ride the motorcycle for the first time in my life. And this motorcycle had to go up, you know, vertical slopes and everything. And I had the fear of my life. And when I was in high school, these German nuns always told us, when you dance, 
Always leave room for the Holy Spirit between yourself and your partner. But I tell you, when I rode that motorcycle, there was no room for the Holy Spirit. I was clinging to that motorcycle like it was the end of the world. And I don't care what he felt at that time. I was clinging to him, but I climbed to him through that 45-minute ride up the mountain and down again. So that was one way that we got to Bukidnon. But at the end of our journey at Bukidnon, at the end of two, after two years, we had fed more than 2,000 children in those mountains. We had built them several classrooms. We have helped their parents through livelihood, through um, better, pieces of, better um, faces of agriculture. You see, their fathers, were, their fathers chopped off their aged old coffee trees and planted cauliflower because the traders asked them to plant cauliflower and they were selling their cauliflower at 35 pesos a kilo. How much do you pay for cauliflower in the market, supermarket here? 200 pesos a kilo. Those farmers were earning 35 pesos a kilo because the traders fooled them into planting cauliflower. So we had to stay there. So clinging to the motorcycle was a little worth it, the motorcycle driver. So we were already into uh, Mindanao, much to the constraint of some people who discouraged us because they knew, they kept telling me, we have so much hunger in Negros, why do we have to move out? But we could not say no. Then one other day, someone called my attention to an article in the Inquirer about a child with a body of a four-year-old, but he was aged 12. He died of malnutrition in a remote village called Glab in Samuanga del Sur. So I knew that if one child died of malnutrition in this village, there must be other malnourished children in that village. So again, we searched for the village. We found more than 100 children who were in very extreme cases of malnutrition. And so we entered that village. Um, that was three years ago. And we went back again last year to bring them even more training on agriculture. And, and these are indigenous people, so we tried to give them you know, even literacy training and other forms of education. But altogether, in Mindanao, we have served more than 5,000 children already with Mingo Meals, enrolling them in their six-month daily nutrition program. But are these numbers really indicators of success? I've rattled off numbers of boats that we have given, children we have fed, livelihood tools that we have given, classrooms that we have built. I don't know if you agree with me, but I don't believe that numbers are really measures of success. I always believe that the best indicator of success is when you have given to someone and filled his heart with so much love that love overflows and that person, no matter how poor he is, becomes a giver himself. And so now I will talk about the man in my life. Okay. Hermi was one of the men in my life. He still is the man in my life. Okay. The man without a dream, remember? Hermi, when he got his boat, had a very good harvest on his first day. What did Hermie do? He gave all his harvest to the church. On the second day, Hermie gave all his harvest to the school. And now, another group of men in my life. We have eight tricycle drivers who were given funds to finally own their own tricycles. A year later, the tricycle drivers came back to us. They gave us a wad of money, and they said, here, buy another tri tricycle for someone like us before. Buy him one so he could start out on his livelihood. The year after that, they came back, gave us another wad of cash, and said, here, 
is money for another tricycle. Find another one like what we were before and build him one. These are people who have, give, who have, to whom we have given, who have now become givers themselves. And we also had a group of fishermen. While we were packing um, mingo and attaching them to um, what, bottles of purified water and sending them, this off to typhoon hit places, we were so busy one day that one of the volunteers stopped me and said, you better go down and look at one of the bottles that we received. And he said, we've been receiving thousands of bottles. What's so important about one case of bottle of mineral water? And she said, just go and look what is written there. And there it said, from the fishermen of Barangay Gargato. People again who learned how to give back. Lastly, I'd like to share a story about another important man in my life. Some of you have heard this story twice, but the people from NVC who are with me have heard this a million times, but I will repeat this story. This is about the man from Palo Leite. His name was Rolando Pamplona. When Typhoon Yolanda came into his house, water flew in very firstly and broke his house down. So Rolando clung to his four children. But his wife, who gave birth only the day before, was lost among the current of water. So the next day, Rolando, with his four children, found that his wife and his infant daughter were gone. So Rolando searched and searched for four days, until one day, Rolando found his wife falling from a payloader along with the rest of the trash. Rolando, of course, was broken. And so, Rolando became one of the recipients of Peter Project. So a few months after Typhoon Rolanda, we gave Rolando his boat. When we, when we turned over the boat, I saw Rolando with his children holding his two-year-old youngest little daughter. As we were about to leave the place of the turnover, the women and the children were loaded up into the trucks, and the men were taking this boat out to the sea back to their shoreline villages. I noticed one little girl in the shoreline looking out into the horizon until one boat could finally hardly be seen at all and was just one little speck into the horizon. I remembered that was Rolanda's daughter. And I thought to myself, what is this little girl thinking? You know, the only father she had known for four months would now be going out into the sea, the same kind of waters which swallowed her mother up. But I, I, the, the family of Rolando became close to my heart. And a few months after that, classes resumed in Leyte. And I remembered Rolando, that little girl named Maria Luisa, and his three other children. I knew that the three other children would be out in school, and Rolando would be out at sea, and I wondered what would happen to that two-year-old little girl. So I talked to our field officer in Leyte and asked her, please go over to the house of Rolando and check how Maria Luisa is fading. When she got to the house of Rolando, she found Rolando on his knees, hugging his little daughter, crying like it was the end of the world. Because what we later found out was that that little girl and his two other children would be taken away by their grandmother to far away Butuan, because the grandmother knew that Rolando would not be able to take care of the child. And Rolando said, I now have a new house. I now have a new boat. I should be the happiest man alive. But no, I have lost my wife. Now I am losing my family. But a year later, the Nepalian earthquake happened. And one of our trustees told us that it would be good to share the story of the devastation of the people of Nepal with our fishermen so that they would know how their disaster was not the only thing that happens in the world, it happens all over. And so our field workers share this story with our fishermen in all, 
in all the shorelines wherever we were giving our Peter Project boats. Among the first stories was given to the group of fishermen to whom Rolando Pamplona belonged. As she ended the story, Rolando stood up, picked out a bill from his pocket. He picked out 20 pesos, got an empty bottle, placed the 20 pesos into the bottle and said, this is my contribution to the people of Nepal. And after that, all the fishermen in all shorelines to whom we've given the boat in Iloilo and Cebu and Leyte and Samar and many other places, they've all pulled out precious pesos from their pockets, placed them in water bottles until we reach six digit figures for contribution of the fishermen to Nepal. More money than they have ever seen in their lives to be given to people whom they have never even met in their whole lives. And to me, this is the biggest measure of a success. People who finally learn the power of giving because they have received as well. So I promise to talk to you about love and thunder. And I've only been talking about love so far. How else can you explain one million passes dropping on our laps? Or Rappler sending a story which brought us to feed more than 5,000 children in Bukidnon? Or Rolando starting off a drive among fishermen? That can only be given by love. I talked to you about things happening by chance, things happening because we saw something or read something or where our hearts were touched, that is only because of love. Now let me talk to you about thunder. Okay. Thunder comes after lightning. Okay. After the burst of lightning, you hear the guns of thunder. The stronger the light, the stronger and louder the thunder. And so, as I have talked to you about love, let me talk to you about the thunders of our lives. It wasn't all light. I mean, feeding children and people giving back, that's not all what we were made of. There was a lot of thunder in our life as an organization as well. First, big thunder. We had already... Mingo was beginning to be known all over. So we had so much market for it, so many feeding programs, so many local governments had already been convinced to take on Mingo. And then one time we were in a meeting, someone from our staff was called, and she said, you know what? There's this group of people in, in far away Mindanao. They opened their warehouse, and Mingo was full of weevils. Worms. There were worms boring through the packs of mingo. We looked at our control samples and they had no worms. But there was this warehouse where mingo was full of worms. That was a thunder. Imagine all this success talking about millions of mingo meals being served all over the country and now you have millions of worms eating into your packs of mingo. Another thunder. This was um, Peter Project. Okay. All the boats of Peter Project have names which are given to us by the donors. They may want to name it after a child, name it after a deceased person, name it after Pope Francis. They can name it any way they wish, and we paint the names of the boats, uh, the names of their donors' choices on the boats. Then one day, I happened to chance upon an email which one of our staff received. And there was this angry woman because, a you know, our, our practice was always to send the donors a photo of the boat with a name that they have selected. Okay. This angry woman showed the photo that she received. It was a photo of a boat whose original name had been painted over very roughly and the new name painted that, which was the donor's choice. And she said, what do you do? Do you just have one boat and paint over the names and just 
you know, just recycle and send the photos to your donors. And I had this, I had this nightmare about seeing this photo on social media and people claiming that all we did was to paint and repaint names over and over again without actually turning over real boats to real recipients. At that time, we already had received donations for thousands of boats. I found out later how it happened because there was a double naming of one boat and someone irresponsibly just painted that name over and put the new donor's name. So there was no duplication of boats, but you had one angry woman who would not listen to an explanation at that time, I felt, because I knew she was hungry. So I sent her off a letter, I introduced myself, I apologized, I told her the real story, and I told her that I assured her I would show her a boat as it is uh, manufactured, including the naming of her boat. But I didn't know whether I would assuage her or anything. So every day for the next few days, I would dream Nightmare. I would have nightmares at night and think that the next morning I would find our names on social media with that, uh, with that kind of angry woman's accusations on our organization. Then, when COVID-19 happened, we felt very proud of ourselves because we never stopped working. We were making PPEs. The women who received sewing machines began to make PPS, PPEs, and we were supplying hospitals in Negros Occidental with PPEs when the rest of the country, health workers did not have theirs. So, you know, uh, hospitals from government, private sectors, even the more expensive hospitals in Bacolod, they were all looking to us to supply them with their PPEs. We were also very busy making, um, filling up meal bags, buying food from our farmers and giving them this away to families who needed food. Um, all this, when we were working remotely, we had no face-to-face -face work at home, and everyone was very busy. But sometimes when you're too busy, you lose a little control. And then we found out that there were some employees who were not doing well with our money, who were pocketing some of our money. That was another thunder. You know, just, just to know that money that is in chores were being pocketed by some people. Also, just because we were too busy and we were losing control. And then, all this time, we were very proud of our vision of self-sufficiently. You see, when we make Mingo, we make a little money here. Okay? But the money that we make goes back completely into our organization so we can feed more children. And we were very proud of this vision of sustainability. Because we looked forward to the time we would be, when we would be making so many Mingo meals that we would no longer even need to look for donors because we would be making enough money to feed all the children we want to feed. I also had a hobby craft. I was making mosaics initially as a hobby, but later I turned over the mosaic craft to artisans whom NVC Foundation wanted to train and so we began to produce artworks, we began to produce um, fashion accessories, and many other simple furniture, all made out of mosaics. All these sales would first be paid to the artisans, but most of all, money made out of these sales would go back to NVC Foundation to help us towards self-sufficiency. And personally, I was very proud of that, because we are not a family foundation with a trust whom we can count on. We are not a corporate foundation with profits of a mother company flowing down to us. We just had to beg and beg and beg and beg for donations all these past years. So I was very proud of our program for self-sufficiency. And at one meeting where we were interviewed by some accreditors, I proudly talk about it, only to be told that we we're not supposed to do that. We were told that, no, you're a non-profit, you're not supposed to make profit. But I said, we're making profit back into the organization. We're not making it for ourselves. But somehow there was a misunderstanding. And um, the meeting 
did not end very well. And well, um, our act of making profit, even if it was a profit for others, was not taken on very lightly. Those were the thunders of our lives. And those were things that cost me sleepless nights, actually. But after the thunder, it's always a welcome relief of silence. Sometimes even a cool shower comes to give you relief. So the same thing happened with our thunder. First, the weevils and the worms. Okay. What happened? Our production manager said, you know, well, first of all, the storehouses of where we send these mingo meals are not in the best of conditions. Of course, it's a sent to impoverished villages and communities, and they don't have good warehousing facilities, and they do have worms. And we pack the mingo meals in plastic, not the way it is right now. We pack it in plastic, and of course, worms can poke through plastic, and that is why we had a lot of worms. So I said, okay, so what, what should we use? And he said, foil, which is what we use now. He said, we should pack mingo in foil. I said, so, okay, why don't we pack mingo in foil? And he said, the machine cost 750,000 pesos. We did not have 750,000 pesos at that time. So I said, okay, let's just bear with potential worms until we can afford 750,000 pesos. But after that meeting, I went out and I had lunch with someone who had been donating about 20 pesos a month uh, to organization, the, the person was Australian. As soon as I sat down to lunch, she asked me, is there anything that you need that I can help you with? So I said, yes, 750,000 pesos. And then I caught myself again and I said, you know, this, she might find this too much. So I said, but you know, you don't have to give me 750,000 pesos. I'll just give us a few pesos and we will put things together. But she said, no, because many projects fail when they are undercapitalized. So I give you 750,000 pesos. So we bought the machine and we began. It was an automated vacuum packing machine. So we were able to um, start making Mingo meals with foil packs. But that's not all. You see, the machine that we bought is actually only 50% of the capacity of our production machine, the, the machine it's, that itself produces Mingo. Then one day a lady came, and she's, she was an American. She said, I came here because I've been dreaming that I was once riding a white horse into a remote village, and I went there, I found hungry children which I needed to feed. So I'm looking to you at a feeding program. At the time, we had an annual report which showed um, a white horse carrying Mingo up the mountains. And I said, is this the horse? And she said, no, it's a little bit too small. It was a bigger horse. But then she began to know about the organization. And we went to the factory producing this. And she had a very sharp mind. And she said, your Mingo producing machine produces twice the capacity of your packing machine. She said, I think you need another machine. I said, I know, we do, but it cost at the time already 1.2 million pesos. And I said, we don't have 1.2 million pesos. She said, let's hold hands and pray. And then she went back to the US, and then two weeks later, she asked again for our bank account number. At the time, we already had a bank account to uh, accept her dollars, and we got the 1.2 million pesos. So we now have the two um, automated packing machines. So that thunder is out of the way. There was welcome rain after that. And then the boat. Okay. The lady who donated the boat whose name was painted over actually gratefully accepted her explanation after I walked her through the production of her boat. And so all swell what ends well. Nothing got to social media. We continued to supply boats and we kept our credibility with the other donors. And if you look at, of course, um, the, the problem of people running away with some of our money, it gave us a lesson. It taught us how to control things better. We were able to arrive at better systems. Uh, we were able to get some and still chasing some. 
but then it's building us into a better and stronger organization as these things happen all the time. As for our sustainability, getting people to understand um, you know, what we're trying to do, what we want to achieve, we're still working at it, but I think we will get there. And so, going back through our lives of love and thunder, there were three guiding principles that I have learned um, in running the organization. One is to never give up on love. And love comes in many forms. Okay? Love comes in the form of people who give. Love comes in the form of people who receive. But never give up on it because it can happen and it can answer the questions that you want them to ask. So I said, we've been living all our lives as NVC Foundation as just linking dreams to donors and donors to dreams. We had nothing to hold on and nothing to stand with except love. So never give up on that. It comes in many forms and it's many times in forms that you least expect. Even when there are people who threaten to put you out on social media, even if they're worms and weevils, that still is a part of love because after the thunder always comes something else. Second is to never run away from the thunder. You just don't know how many times I've literally knelt on the floor asking for the thunder to stop. Ultimately, the thunder would stop. But many times, it was always because I had to do something. Many times, I had to humble myself to, in the front of the donors. Many times, I had to do things which I ordinarily would not do because they would be out of my comfort zone. But all the peace and all the coolness of the shower after the thunder always happened because we never ran away from the thunder. And lastly, never give up on God. God is your higher power, will also come in many forms. But God who touches everyone will always give an answer through others, through you, in my case, through the man in my life, but in many forms, God will always be there and God will always give an answer. And so whatever you do, whatever you become, whatever you organize, be it a small startup enterprise the way we started ours, as long as you do things the way God has planned for you and ask his guidance, you will become even bigger than you ever planned to be, as long as you never give up on God and you never run away from the thunder and as long as you always believe in love. So that's, that's the little story of our organization. Um, I'll ask her questions. Is there anyone who would like to ask any questions or clarifications? No. Thank you very much, Madam Kilaiko, for that very enlightening and inspiring talk. Let us give her a round of applause. <laughs> now for the question and answer part, and I uh, am uh, very pleased to see the room full of students who are only raring to uh, ask questions. There are two uh, microphones in either aisle, and I'd like to invite any question from the students, which will be answered by Madame Kilaiko and her colleagues. Anyone, please? I think she's given a very complete narrative about her story. But I'd like to ask myself one question to Madame Kilaiko. It's a question of scalability, and I think most of you are uh, studying strategy. How far more can you, in a vision, uh, bring uh, the size of your 
uh, organization as well as your efforts uh, within the country. Uh, and I, by, by scalability, I mean widening the uh, uh, area of your service and also deepening the levels of service that you can provide. Thank you. Um, I'll talk first about our nutrition program. Um, as we started our nutrition program, we were told by the Department of Science and Technology that when you feed children, you bring the mothers to the health center, um, mix the mingo meals, and feed the children in those uh, nutrition centers. When I shared this with our volunteers who had been in feeding programs in the past, they told me that this was impossible. This couldn't be done because mothers are all, many of the mothers who are either too poor, too lazy, or too engrossed with many other things so that they could not bring their children to the center daily for six months. And so I asked them what the solution was. And they said, we have to produce something instant and give this to the mothers and give this for 15 days at a time so that we can weigh the children only every 15 days and then till finally we could bring them out. And it is this process which we scaled and which made it possible to field all these 50,000 children that have been enrolled in several times in different times of the year. Now, we looked at the program for stunting. You see, in the past, for 12 years, we've been feeding children who were undernourished. Now we look at the figures of stunting in the Philippines. When you look at undernourished or underweight children, you measure children for their weight according to their age, uh, uh, divide their weight by their age. When you measure stunted children, you measure children for their height versus their age. That means they're too short for their age. The Philippines has one of the highest numbers of stunting. Now, a very successful model of curbing stunting is in Brazil. But in Brazil, their program for stunting involves feeding children daily in a hospital setting, giving the children 80% of their calorie requirements. They would find change in their children after only 41 months. We know that in the Philippines, we cannot do this. We cannot have enough resources and enough facilities to feed the children the way Brazil did. This was our first challenge of scaling things. We knew that we have to scale, design our program so that we can scale it, so we can bring the same amount of children to succeed in the nutrition program the way we have done with underweight children. So that's challenge number one. And right now we're conducting all sorts of experiments and uh, finding ways to improve the nutritional content of this so that we will give the children enough nutrition and take it home so that we can follow the same practice. That's only in one of our programs. Now, if we talk about scaling what we are doing as an organization, this is my answer. We don't have to scale it under our name. Any person, any volunteer who does the kind of good that we do, whether it is done by ourselves or done by the people who have now given after we have given to them, that is scaling the goodness. That means any of you right now can get up from this room and scale what we are doing in your own backyard, in your own classrooms, in your own villages. Because wherever we look at, there are children who need us to feed. You may feed them with mingo, but you may not. All you need to do is to look at what they need. But there are children around us. There are people who need livelihood, and all you need to do is to look for them. There are people who need different types of education. You can look at children in your neighborhood and maybe help share what you already know inside your minds. That is scaling. We don't have to do it in terms of an organized establishment. We don't have to do it 
using something that's already being done. You can use your own minds, your own creativity. Just remember, you never give up on love. Love is inside you, and love is all around you. You never run away from the thunder. Thunder can mean all those ugly scenes around you, the scenes of, impo of poverty, the scenes of hunger, the scenes of joblessness around you. Just don't run away from it. And never give up on God, because God will help you find the solution. Scaling can be in the terms that we ordinarily look at it, but scaling can also be in just really being vehicles and missionaries for what God has set you out to do. Just find your mission, and you are scaling whatever good you are meant to do. Was it, is there something else that I didn't answer? I didn't answer you. Okay. okay. Did I answer your question, sir? Yeah, okay. I'm asking for more questions. Are there any other questions, please? Okay. If there's not with la none, there's would like to. Uh, there's one. Okay, please. Hello. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not a student. I'm a, I'm actually a teacher. Uh, LAS 140. So hi to my students. Hello. Yeah. So I'm JP Alonso. I teach LAS 140. So thank you for the very insightful talk, ma'am. Uh, I'm pretty sure our students got something from it. But um, I guess just to paint the context here, most of the students that we ask to actually attend this session are juniors, third year students, or fourth year students, right? So you've had a lot of experience in the social entrepreneurship world. So would you be able, since in a few months or in a year or so, they'll be graduating now. So, and they might be thinking, oh, do I really want to entertain doing social entrepreneurship or do more of like the stable corporate type of job? So can you give practical tips for them to be able to better assess if this is a field that they would want to actually even entertain? Yeah. And number two, being in the social entrepreneurship world uh, for some time, would you be able to advise which particular skill set these young people can bring in to the social entrepreneurship world? So thanks. Um, all the time I was in school, I wanted to be part of the corporate world. Okay, I, you know, I wanted the, the security of a good salary. I felt that I could make it all the way to the top, and that's where I really wanted myself to be. But then, somewhere along the way, I began to see that social entrepreneurship was something that was really more rewarding. It's more difficult. That's what I can tell you. Um, skill sets that you would need, one is, in most corporate jobs, you walk away from the office and on the weekends you can say, that's not my problem anymore. When you're starting up in a corporation, there's always something higher than you are and the box stops with him and not with you. When you become an entrepreneur, the box will stop with you. Okay? So what skill set do you need? Are you willing to face the thunder? That's one. In a corporate job, someone else can face the thunder. You say, sir, someone brought this problem up. Sir, can you resolve it? And all the way to the top, even the CEO can give it to the board of directors, give it to a lawyer. But when you're a startup entrepreneur, the buck really stops with you. You'll have no lawyer to protect you. You'll have no accounting department to do the math for you. You'll have no one else to do. You will have to be the driver. You'll have to be the master. So you, are you ready to start from the bottom? You probably will not be wearing corporate clothes. You may not be afford to drive your own car or even buy your own car. You have to, if you are in business of uh, manufacturing, worst, I mean, that's even worse for you. You have to be the boss, you have to be the manufacturer, you have to be the packer, you have to be the shipper. But most of all, just remember, if you're not willing to face the thunder, you can't be an entrepreneur. That's one. Number two, if you're not ready to work 24 hours a day, you can't be an entrepreneur. You can't close the doors and say, I'm on vacation, because even if you're on vacation, you have to face the responsibility. 
the bottom line is really just to remember if I be, there's just the two basic differences. If I take a corporate job, the buck will not stop with me until maybe 30 years later when I become the CEO. If I start as an entrepreneur, the buck will stop with me. But then, if you become an entrepreneur, success may come tomorrow or overnight. If you join a corporate job, a thousand other people will share that success. You even have to struggle, you even have to fight there is a lot of infighting in, in a corporate job. When you become the entrepreneur, you are the boss. So um, that there's a lot of difference there. But as an entrepreneur, remember, you just have to be everything. You have to know your math. You have to know your communication skills. You have to do a lot of writing. You have to do a lot of speaking. You'll have to work the sweat out of your bros. You just have to be really to, ready to work whenever you can. And as an entrepreneur, one thing that you have to remember, you will have financial problems and how. I mean, those are the times maybe you will even kneel, go on your knees more often than anybody else. When salary time comes, I remember the most, the, I think that was when I began to realize and I was most at the crossroads as an entrepreneur versus someone who received a salary. As a person who worked in a corporation, I so looked forward to the 15th and 30th of the month when I would be receiving my salary. As an entrepreneur, how I dreaded the 15th and the 30th of the month because that meant I had to have enough money to pay the salaries of the people who worked for me. So that's the very difference in the world of an entrepreneur and a world of someone who works in a corporation. But as long as you're, not will, as long as you're willing to r not run away from that kind of thunder, you have the best gains and the best satisfaction as an entrepreneur. Because all the joys and all the victories will be yours as well. And all I just can say to you is, when you build your own enterprises, always please never forget your social responsibility towards those who work for you primarily, and again, next, towards those who purchase from you, because you ourselves are, re are responsible for them, and next, of course, to the society at large. Um, then, of course, please do not forget that when you become an entrepreneur, there are things that you have to face which many people in the corporate world do not face. These are the financial problems. These are all the challenges. But then again, when you have to face um, even your families, when you have a growing family, your own enterprise will take, takes up so much of your time, of your talent, and your energy. And many times, your own enterprise becomes your family's worst competition. So another important thing about your own enterprise is knowing how to balance your life, your time, and your energy versus that of your families or your loved ones as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Kilaiko, for those brilliant answers. I, I think you took uh, the job of the lecturer, the teacher uh, in class in guiding them for the future. Now that we're done with the open forum, uh, please hang on because we still have to hear from our dean, uh, Roby Galang. But it, at this point, we'd like to ask Madam Kilaiko and her companions to be in front, and we will present a token of gratitude to uh, NVC and to uh, Madame Kilaiko, and then we'll have some pictures. The uh, token of gratitude will be presented by our Dean Robbie Galang. Thank you very much for visiting us. And we also have uh, a recently published book on leadership because uh, you are a Thank 
And now the closing remarks from Dean Roby Galang. So, um, on behalf of the John Gokongwe School of Management, we are again are very grateful for uh, the appearance and the talk by uh, Miliki Laiko. No? Um, I've worked with an, their organization, no, the, the Grense Volunteers for Change, for quite some time because uh, my classmate here and the uh, seatmate from Ateneo, Therese, uh, brought uh, all the great work that they've been doing to my attention. And in fact, uh, my daughter, Lucia, uh, one of her paintings was featured in one of the mosaics that uh, Millie was talking about earlier, and that was used for a fundraiser. No? So this is an organization that is really close to our hearts, uh, both personally and, of course, as Ateneo, no? because we really are happy to support and honor uh, people like Millie who really come here to change the world. Um, but the thing that we really wanted to showcase that you know, the reason why we brought her today here to this public lecture and why this is being supported by the John Gokongwe School of Management is that a lot of the narratives that she talked about today, you know, uh, is really about what we teach here at the school, you know. When she talked about how she transformed a political organization into a social enterprise, right? That is what we teach in human resource. That's what we teach in strategy, you know. That's what we teach in leadership. Uh, when she talked about having to fundraise to get a million pesos to start the program, as well as 700,000 pesos to build the new factories. I think those are the things that we talk about. That's finance, right? When she talked about how we utilize, instead of you know, the, the random food supplements that she worked with the Department of Science and Technology, that's innovation, that's research. No? So even if she said that you know, maybe some of the tools that she did isn't management, I think that's really uh, everything that she talked about no? is really how to really do management. No? Because, again, what I'd like to, everyone to remember is that the John Gokong Wei School of Management is not a school of business. Nowhere in our name appears the word business. The Grad School of Business is in Rockwell, not here. Uh, what we teach here is management because we believe the tools that we provide you are really there for you to get things done, to make a change. No? So whether the change that you find for yourself is change in the corporate sector where you try to improve you know, the lives of the Filipino by providing jobs, by providing employment, by providing better enhanced products, that's where you'll be, no? But if you, we also want to work in a social enterprise, no? When the work that we want to do is to solve hunger, no? Is to provide better meals for malnutrition, malnourished kids, and how to create more livelihood to the people in our shorelines. So that's also management, no? So I think what we're hoping that you take away from this program is that, you know, the tools that we provide you in your three or four years here are really there for you to be able to make the change that you want to make, no? And of course, if you're able to make these grand changes, what do you become? What's love and thunder, no? That's the words of a superhero. That's the words of an Avenger. And so we're very glad today that we have a real live Avenger in our midst, not someone as Chris Hemsworth looking like me, but someone who really has true superpowers, who with all her efforts has really transformed the way uh, we as a Filipino learn from each other. And the transformative thing that she has done for me is not just to provide feeding programs, but to really transform these people, to provide them dreams, and to also provide them with the ability to themselves be agents of change. Now, so on that note, let's uh, provide another warm Ateneo round of applause to Mili Kulaiko and the Negrense Volunteers for Change because these are the types of uh, you know, futures that we want to create for everyone. So on that note, thank you very much for joining us this morning and uh, let me turn the floor over back to Art. So thank you everyone. Thank you Dean Robbie. and as we close the program, let me just uh, leave you with one advice. After a night of terror and thunder, the birds still sing in the morning. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh shit, it's unwritten. The one where